Okay, we are back today on Total Life Fitness Podcast, and I'm here today with a special guest. We have 2012 Miss Olympia winner in the bikini division, Nat- Natalia Mello. Uh, Natalia, has, as I mentioned, is the 2012 Miss Olympia winner, uh, first Brazilian to do so. Uh, she's finished four times inside the top five at the Miss Olympia competition. She's finished in the top five at the Arnold Sports Festival six times. She's been featured in Cosmopolitan, Shape Magazine, Oxygen, Daily Mail, Muscle and Fitness Hers, and many more. And in fact, she was on the cover of Muscle and Fitness Hers in over 20 countries. Uh, She was even ranked number five in Flex Magazine as an all-time fitness model. Uh, She's also a, a fitness model as well. And she's traveled to over 30 countries to provide seminars on topics related to health and fitness, as well as training during pregnancy. She also has a pretty big following over on Instagram. I think when I looked this morning, she has 276,000 followers. So definitely, uh, she has uh, been a force in the fitness industry. Natalia, welcome to the show. Oh, that was a that was a hell of an intro. I like that. Every time that I do a podcast, I'm going to invite you over to do my intro because that like hyped me up. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Well, we're, we're, stating, we're stating facts here. It's all true. But uh, yeah, so, um, you know, Natalia, I think everyone looks at you today and they're like, holy cow, like she's so incredible. You know, I could never do that. Maybe a lot of people listening to this would never even want to do that. Like they just kind of want to be fit themselves. But like, let's take it through, like kind of from the beginning, like how did your journey start? Like when you were, you know, you were born in Brazil and then, you know, you got into fitness. Like how did you first venture into fitness? Oh, I love this question because um, it's funny in Brazil, it is, um, that's where I'm originally from. And in Brazil, it's very um, common for for people to, to go to the gym, uh, especially women from a fairly young age, because we do not have a very strong uh, sports program in schools. So I wanted to be active and uh, I asked my mom to join the gym. And I was about 14. And then she told me that she wasn't going to pay for it because it wasn't going to be a waste of money. And at the time, being a 14-year-old, I had an allowance. So in order for me to go to the gym, because gym memberships back then, we're talking about like over 20 years ago. I'm 37 now. So whatever many years that is. um, It was very expensive, especially for a 14-year-old. At the time, they didn't even have direct debit. You literally had to go to the desk and pay your monthly membership. So with my allowance, I could only afford, um, um, I had to save for two months in order to be able to pay for one month membership. So I could only go to the gym every other month, but I would use my whole allowance to be able to, uh, to go to the gym. And my mom was like, I'm not paying. I'm like, don't you worry about it. I got it taken care of, challenge accepted. So uh, that was kind of my introduction to the gym. And I was very, I have always been very passionate about it. And I think that the fact that my mom challenged me on it and didn't want to support that one thing that I wanted to do gave like, gave a little bit of an extra drive to it. Yeah, well, that's quite a story about, you know, you just saving up on your own, like being committed and dedicated to getting the gym. So first of all, how did you even get into, like, why were you even interested in the first place at, at 14 years old? Um, that's actually a good question. And my answer makes me sound a bit like a control freak, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, I think that it's, um, I, cr- I, I think as a teenager living with your parents, you do not have a lot of control over your life. Um, you're being told what time to be home, what, what, like, what, what your room needs to look like at a certain time, that you need to clean it up, that you have to do this, that you have to do that. So I almost feel like being in the gym and being able to create, like, to, to shape my body gave me some control in the one thing that I could control, which was my body, because everything else, when you live with your parents is being controlled by your parents. So I think that um, now looking back, I think that I just came to this epiphany, like recently, um, after a lot of therapy must admit. Um, But I think that it was primarily from the control uh, uh, side of things for me to have that control of something when everything else in my life was out of my control. 
So that's actually really interesting. And I always think it's interesting to ask people about how they kind of got into things in the first place. So now, you know, obviously, you know, we look at you, you're this very confident person. So would you say that fitness in general kind of propelled you to, to build more confidence in yourself as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And actually, just kind of going back, and I think that another thing that made me very driven to to understand more about how the body works and things like that is that my mom was always um she's always very she's always been very pro quick fix fat diet like i grew up from age 12 with my mom doing the cabbage soup diet the vegetable only diet the lettuce diet for six weeks and like so i grew up in an environment where fat diets were a thing and I kept on seeing my mom going to a diet, losing, let's say 10, 15, 20 pounds, and then gaining all back on and off, on and off, on and off. And I'm like, there has to be a different way of doing this. And that was kind of like what made me curious. And as I, as I became older, and then now whenever we're starting to talk about whenever I started competing, whenever you're saying about the confidence, I think that it, it, it has been more than confidence because there were many times whenever I was competing that the, I would train up to six hours a day uh, at the level that I was competing. That's what needed to be done in order to accomplish the things that I accomplished. Um, so there were many times that I cried on the treadmill. There were many times that I literally didn't think that I could push any farther. And I worked as a, I worked full time as well. I had like three jobs as I was getting ready for the biggest bodybuilding competition in the world, which is the Olympia. So there were many times that physically and emotionally, I felt like I couldn't do it, but I had to do it because if I, if I wanted to accomplish my goal, that these were the steps that needed to be taken. So looking back, having that drive, that discipline, that commitment, and being able to see that I could overcome, even when I really, really, really didn't think that I could, that determination has bled into other parts of my life. With my training now, with my uh, business, with my coaching programs, with the way that I speak with my clients. So I really think that the discipline and the, the resilience that competing has given me, it's not so much the confidence. I think that the confidence came more with age and, you know, like, love me, hate me, take me as I am, you know. I, I, I'm not going to change for other people. And, 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 and I think that this came more with, as I got older than so much from the competition itself. But I do think that the competition built the resilience and the discipline to keep on accomplishing great things. Yes. I absolutely love that story. I love that background. It's always interesting to me how people kind of become the way they are because I've I've generally found that people who are successful in different areas of their lives, they're not like that their whole lives. It usually is something that's developed over time. And I, and I appreciate you sharing that. So, you know, now take us through. So you started working out when you're 14, you know, you saved up for this gym membership. How do you go from, you know, this, this 14 year old girl who's just kind of interested in fitness to all of a sudden you're competing in the high, you know, competitions at the highest level. Like what's that transition for you? How, do you, how does that happen? Um, I think that we kind of like have to go back a little bit. So I started going to the gym and stuff like that. And then whenever I was 18 in Brazil, law school is a bachelor's degree. It's not a master's degree like um, it is here in the US. So whenever I got to um, college age, I was in law school and I got to law school when I was 17. Um, and then halfway through, you know, when you have like one of those epiphanies and then you're like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I just felt like I was living everybody else's dream because originally I really wanted to go to uh, physical education, which would be like in Brazil for you to be a personal trainer, you have to be, have a bachelor's degree. And that's the, 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 the course that I wanted to take. But my mom uh, was like, no, like there isn't a lot of money to be made. You know, like the mindset that your parents normally want the best for you. They want you to be a doctor, an accountant, a lawyer, something that is more, um, a more established uh, profession. 
And then I was like, I honestly cannot do this. I'm leaving everybody else's dream. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go to the U.S. So I, my, I sold my Fiat Uno car, <laughs> which, uh, and dropped out of law school halfway through, paid my bills that I didn't have many. And then by the time I bought my ticket and got to the U.S., I had $350 left. So I arrived to the U.S. age 20 with $350 and I had to figure it out. So I worked as a, I worked cleaning restaurants overnight to earn $30 to work from 11 o'clock until six o'clock in the morning. Um, I bartended, I did like I was a, a cocktail waitress um, in a martini bar. I was a waitress in a Italian restaurant. So I did everything that I needed to do to make ends meet. Um, and then whenever I started bartending, I kind of started falling into a very unhealthy lifestyle. And that was kind of like another aha moment that I had. And I'm like, again, what the hell am I doing with my life? Mm. I, I needed something to challenge me. And that's kind of when I decided to start competing. So my goal when I started competing wasn't necessarily for the physical appearance because I didn't even necessarily find the appearance like the physical appearance, that appealing. I was more in it for the personal challenge. And everybody was like, oh, there is no way that you're going to be able to do it. And I'm like, hold my beer. <laughs> so um, I think that the more people, the more people told me that I couldn't do it, the more people told me that um, it was going to be impossible because of the type of job that I had, bartending and things like that, the more I wanted to do it. So it was more of a personal challenge than necessarily wanting to look a certain way wow and I, i'm gonna pause you here right a second too i mean this is incredible like you are going to law school like you mentioned you kind of felt like that's what you're supposed to do that's what people wanted you to do but you, mm -hmm. you felt down deep in your heart that's not what what was meant to do and then you literally leave for the u.s with like 300 dollars in your pocket and you probably have you know some debt from from school and everything i mean how did others respond? Like when you made that decision, like you drop out of law school, you move to the U S for something that doesn't even seem like a, like a career or something they can even do. Like, like, how did you handle, handle that? Um, I, I mean, I just knew that I didn't want to live the life that I was going towards if I stayed in Brazil. I just, I, that was uh, something that was for sure. I knew that I didn't want to have that life. Everything past that would be a bonus. So my mom, like she should call me every, I never told my mom my all the struggles that I went through because I knew that if I told her, then she would convince me to go back. And I was adamant that I was not going to go back. I wanted to, I like, because my thing is that I wanted to have like a house or an apartment and know that the TV was there because I wanted it to be there. Even if it was upside down, I wanted to be in charge of the decisions of my life. And I was only going to be able to do that by like cutting the umbilical cord. And that's what I did. Wow. So I didn't really care what people had to say because it was my life ultimately. Yeah, good for you for, for obviously chasing your dreams and chasing your passions. Then, right, you're you're working night shift. I mean, you're doing whatever it takes to to keep your dream going. So then, like you said, you kind of did it out of out of a challenge. Like, kind of got into to competing. So take us through like when you first started competing. Like, you know, how how did you get started? How did you go from like just interested in competing or just interested more in fitness to competing at the highest level and ultimately winning the the Miss Olympia? So um, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time when I first started competing and I started to meet a lot of people who had influence and like edit, um, editors for magazines and taking like doing shoots with photographers that had work published in big magazines. So before even my first competition, I, I was featured on Flex magazine, which going back like to 2009, 2008, 
it is a big deal because social media wasn't as big then as it is now. And I'm just aging myself, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so magazine back then was kind of like the only way that you would be seeing and things like that. So I was able to establish myself um, in the bikini division because it was new. And, and I met the right people that were able to, and I built relationships as well with, with people who, who saw me and they were like, hold on, this girl has something to offer. And then I start to like do workout programs for women's magazines as well. So all of that, and it kind of started to give me the confidence that I needed to kind of like, that's a sign. I need to keep on pushing forward, but never, for a, like for a long time, I didn't look at competing as my career. I kept on bartending. I was bartending two nights before I won the Olympia, wow. which is the biggest. Most people can afford to just take off work. I couldn't because if I didn't work, I wouldn't have money to pay my bills. So I would like, I would bartend Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I also did personal training during the day and I prepped for the Olympia. So I was going on probably like about four hours sleep, but I had goals. I had things that I wanted to accomplish. And it was almost like the, like every time that I thought about giving up, there would be a sign, like a magazine reaching out, asking to do a photo shoot with me. Um, so you and I had sponsorships from the get go, which is very uncommon for amateur athletes, especially back then without social media. So um, I just kept on going. I like I, I knew in my heart that there was something great mm. waiting for me. I just had to keep on going. Wow, and that's incredible too. And that was going to be my next question as well. Is like you're literally, like you said, you're on four hours of sleep. You're working multiple jobs, your bartending, your personal training, like just to pay the bills. I mean, I think that's pretty incredible to stay with it that whole time, despite the fact like nothing is guaranteed, right? I mean, this is a sport, you know, for those who don't know, who have never competed mm -hmm. or I've just competed once, but you know, it's, it, it's, it's a judge's sport. So basically you're judged by, by these people. And there's, it's not always even hundred percent in your control, whether you can even win. Um, and for those who don't know as well, the Miss Olympia is the highest honor that you can receive in the world. So, I mean, Natalia has, has literally been to the top of the mountain here. So, I mean, how do you stay? Like, I think that's the biggest thing that so many people struggle with is staying that focus for that long, even with all these setbacks and, and there, you, you know, the setbacks are coming. Like you mentioned, you kind of had those signs, but still like in the back of your mind, like, how do you stay with it? for that long and sacrifice and suffer for that long in order to achieve what you achieved? I had a very deep why. I, want, I, wanted to, I wanted to live the American dream. You know what I mean? Like I really, um, I wanted to, and this might sound selfish and this might not even be the right reason why I did things, but it worked for me. But I just wanted to look at everybody who doubted me and be like, can I curse? Yeah. Can I? He'd be like, toodaloo, motherfucker, watch, it, watch me. <laughs> Hold my beer. You know what I mean? Like, so I think that I, like uh, many people I see using criticism and setbacks, they use that to bring them down. I used every single negative thing that I heard throughout my journey as fuel. Mm. Because for like, for my, my personal position is like, there is nothing better than proving people wrong with success. I didn't have to say a word. I just had to hand them one of my magazines with a cover or a picture with Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Love it. So you were really driven by, like you said, kind of all the people who doubted you, like you wanted to live the American dream, like you wanted to do things your way. And yeah you were obviously willing to, to do whatever it took. So, you know, obviously, like I said, you got to the top of the mountain. Clearly, you were very, very driven at that point. So now, you know, you're, you're a, a wife, a mother. Um, you kind of own, you own your own fitness business where you help and coach women and, and inspire a lot of people. So how did you transition to, you know, competing to now you're kind of you're, to not competing, basically? Or how did you make that decision? Um, so competing is a 
very um and for you you have competed and any of your listeners who might have competed it is a very selfish sport so whenever um me and my husband my husband is irish like he's northern irish he's from uh, uh northern ireland and we met when i lived in fort lauderdale we did long distance for two and a half years then eventually i moved to ireland and i lived with him there for five years so for a long time that I competed, we were together, but we were doing long distance. So I could be selfish because I didn't have people around me. So whenever I lived with him and I started to, and my husband is a professional athlete as well. He was a professional rugby player. And I saw that he had a lot of normalcy in his life, even though he was a top level professional athlete who played for Ireland and like all-star teams and things like that. It kind of started to make me question the direction in which the extremes of the competitive world was was taking me. And I knew that we were going, moving towards the next step, which was to have kids, to have a family. And um, I didn't want my future children to have those extreme mindsets. and I wanted to be able to have a healthier relationship with food. And shortly after that, uh, and, and another thing is that I loved competing, but I hated coaching competitors. Mm. I never coached anybody for competition, even though I could have made a crap ton of money doing so because I was Miss Olympia. But for me, it wasn't about the money, it was about the passion. And if you was a maybe, for me, a maybe is a hell no. So, and then I kind of like had a quarter life crisis, I think. And then I fell pregnant with my son. And then whenever I fell pregnant with my son, everything that I knew about fitness became a blur, even though I had been involved in fitness for almost 10 years. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, almost no, almost 20 years. What I'm talking about almost 20 years because I had my son, I was like 32. So I'm like, I have no idea like what I can or cannot do, even though I'm very good at the fitness thing. So that's when I became very curious and very interested in doing all the courses available. Like I flew to London to take a whole week course on pre and post NATO uh, uh, training, not only for me, because I wanted to make sure that my baby was staying safe with my training, but also because I felt the moral responsibility to to give right information on social media because social media is great, but you see so much bullshit in it. And I didn't want to add to the BS element of social media. I wanted to make sure that I was giving correct information. And the more I dug into it and the more pregnant I became and the more I started to see the physical changes my body was going through and how challenging pregnancy and postpartum can be, it really became my passion to help other moms just like me. Mm. That like, even like, I can't imagine, I can't now because I work with these moms every single day, but somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience in fitness become pregnant and they're told oh just listen to your body what the hell are you listening for like (laughs) you know there is so much vague information that I really really felt that there was the need for somebody who was honest about everything that pregnancy is and isn't because there is such a like people are tend to romanticize the whole pregnancy thing and in my personal opinion freaking sucks Mm. so I think that the market needed somebody who was honest and knowledgeable Mm. about training during pregnancy training after pregnancy and spoke in a way that people could understand and Mm. not like trying to get all fancy pants with the terminology of things just to make themselves sound smart and leave the audience not knowing what the hell they just said yeah. So that's kind of where I transitioned from the competitive world more into the pre and post NATO arena. Love it. I appreciate you sharing your journey about how you kind of got out of it. Obviously, you know, you were pregnant with, with your first child. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, that was going to be one of my next questions was how did you transition then to a coach, which you just explained, because I think that 
you know, it was interesting because you were literally the top competitor and you decided not to train Olympia competitors. Clearly you had a, had a different passion and that was, you know, helping mom. So, you know, kind of, it sounded like you kind of explained it already too, but yeah. How did you really transition to, you know, you are a competitor, like you're an athlete to now you're a coach because that's a completely different mindset. And how did you decide to make kind of that your, your career and calling? Um, I think that like from a competitive standpoint, um, so when I competed, as I said, I loved competing, but I do know that the line of the healthy and the unhealthy in the competitive world, it's very thin and they are very blurred. And you sometimes cross those lines of the healthy and the unhealthy without even notice because you get so obsessed with winning mm -hmm. at all costs. And I didn't want to add to that extreme mindset because I know how much it took from me to be able to overcome those extreme mindsets. So I have made my mission, like a lot of the ladies who I work with are former competitors who are having a very hard time managing time because mm -hmm. they are used to not having a child and being able to spend countless hours in the gym and live off broccoli and freaking ice cubes. Um, and then now they have a child who is fully dependent on them. Their bodies look completely different. They don't know what the hell they can or cannot do. Mm -hmm. And they don't have many people who can understand because there is like, there is this message of body positivity, which I'm all about it. But I feel like people are getting a bit too obsessed with the body positivity that they are almost canceling out how people are actually feeling. Mm. If you like, so I have a mom who comes to me and they're like, I don't like my body. I, I feel horrible in the body that I'm living in. I don't think that looking at them and be like, you should love your body for what it has created because it's so great. That's not going to fix the problem. Mm. Yeah. So I think that we need to start talking a little bit more about the body positivity message from a standpoint of, yeah, you're not happy about it. I totally understand that freaking sucks. What can we do about it? What, how can we change it? How can we incorporate fitness in a healthy lifestyle into your life and into your new routine that has significantly changed and your priorities have changed, but it is important to you to look a certain way. Acknowledge people's feelings instead of just telling them to be happy with what they have. And it's so amazing. And like so many people can have kids. Yeah, like just because other people cannot have kids and cannot experience pregnancy, it doesn't cancel out the way people are feeling about their bodies. Mm -hmm. Totally. So I think that that is a very strong part of my message because that is another thing that I saw a lot in the pre and postnatal population, like uh, uh, the coaching arena was the fact that not many people were talking about the feelings. They were talking about, oh, you just have to be so grateful because it's so amazing. And motherhood is like this beautiful rainbow and butterflies thing. No, sometimes it's hard. And whenever you look at your body in the mirror and you don't recognize it when you used to be fit as hell, it sucks. Mm. And it is what it is. And there is nothing wrong with that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I can clearly tell this is a, a passion of yours. And, and one thing, you know, you can definitely tell from Natalia is that she's very you know, willing and open to share her opinion on things and stand by her principles, which I think is, is amazing. I get to see this, you know, very consistently. Natalia and I are in the, in the same coaching group, which is how we connected. But yeah, I think it's, it's kind of amazing that you are really leading by example too, because obviously you have kids now, like yet you still stay in really good shape. So take me through now, like, you know, a lot of people listening are probably in that situation where like they've become parents or their lives have gotten busier. They're not, you know, they don't have as much time as they used to. So how has your fitness regimen changed or how is it different now that you're a mother? Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I, I work a lot with my clients and things like that is like what number one, prioritizing. Um, you know, uh, if fitness is important, like everybody has the same 24 hours in the day and it is finding what is one important to you is staying in shape and working out and feeling confident in your body, a priority to you. If it is, 
then we need to find somewhere in your schedule time to incorporate some workouts. It might not be uh, an hour and a half long workout, but a 20 minute workout is still better than sitting on the couch feeling sorry for yourself and complaining about being out of shape. So I think that first addressing that and stop with the outsourcing blame. Oh, it's my kid's fault. Oh, and it's my husband's fault. No, it's your fault. Nobody shoved the cake down your throat. Stop it. Mm. So I think that being honest with, with yourself um, and being honest with myself, that was another thing as well. Like, it's, like my kids, it's not my kid's fault. It is ultimately my choice mm. to, to do what is important to me. Um, and finding a flexible approach to my nutrition that allows me to have a life to be a wife, to be have an ice cream with my son, have an ice cream with my daughter, and um, still stay in decent shape. So it's really changing that extreme mindset that I had from competing into a more uh, flexible approach that it's very healthy as well because I never wanted my kids to grow up um, with negative thoughts about food and about their bodies. So um, it's been something that I have been very... Um, cautious on I don't even like to use the word diet in my house mm. and me and my husband we joke we say we're, we're watching our figure but we don't use the word diet absolutely yeah I, I, a lot of really golden nuggets in there especially because we do have a lot of parents busy working professionals who do listen to to this show and I think that one of the things that you said is you kind of switch from a more kind of extreme approach to a little bit more flexible approach and I think for parents that that's really necessary so when you say like, just for those who maybe don't understand like what that means, when you say like you follow a flexible approach and are still able to maintain the results that you are, like you're not like super hardcore like you used to be into fitness, but you're still obviously very passionate about it. But what, what does kind of like a more flexible approach mean for people? Um, I think that people are, are so I, I recently asked on my Instagram what people is struggle the most when it comes to their fitness. And their number one response was consistency. Mm. Why are people struggling to be consistent? Because they are looking for extremes. No carb diet. Uh, intermittent fasting for like 72 hours. Um, uh, like every, like juicing for three days to cleanse whatever the hell it is. It's not sustainable. So you are not going to be able to be consistent with something that is not sustainable. So even if you can start with like, if you, if you tend to have, I don't know, like a, a huge portion, like it, let's say if you go to McDonald's, I wouldn't recommend a client to be eating McDonald's every day, but you know what? Kids like the, the happy meal and I, I'm not going to deprive my children from having that from time to time. I'm not a fan, but if I'm there, okay. So instead of having a Big Mac with the largest fries and the largest everything that there is available, I am going to get maybe a smaller burger with the small fries. Just right there, I probably shaved off a whole bunch of calories. But people have such like, um, and another thing is like, um, I love my glass of wine. If anybody like follows me on social media, you're going to know that wine is my jam. And I think that whenever you, I, whenever you tell somebody you can never drink again because drinking is what is making you gain weight and stuff like that. And the person is a very sociable person and it's a lot, a lot in like social events where drinking is involved. Like my husband is Irish. I don't need to say much more about that. Like the Irish like their beverages, <laughs> our, our <laughs> beverages. So, so um the person is only going to be able to maintain that for so long until they crack and they just go back to the extreme mindsets. So teaching people about portion control, about, okay, so if you have, I don't know, if you used to have ice cream five times a week, how about we do ice creams three times a, three times a week? Um, what if uh, instead of doing wine five times a week, because it's probably not healthy for you, how about we do wine twice a week? All of these are going to reduce your overall caloric intake for the week without you having to sacrifice the things that you like. Love that. Love that. And that's kind of getting into my next question as well as let's say that we have some, we have a lot of, you know, like I said, parents, busy working professionals, 
people who don't have all the time in the world, you know, listening to this, this episode and, you know, who used to have more time, but now talk to that person who's feeling stuck right now. They, they used to be much more athletic. They used to be in better shape. Time demands have just kind of taken over their life. They're kind of, you know, they'll do stuff for maybe a couple of weeks and they'll kind of fall off. Like if you could just give like one piece of advice to that person to get them moving back in the right direction, what would it be? start small. Um, and I think that, that this is a big problem. Like whenever we are talking about um, like New Year's resolution and things like that, people are like, oh yeah, they go from like not going to the gym at all to committing in their head. Okay, I'm going to go to the gym six times a week and then I'm going to do an hour of cardio and I'm going to trade for another hour and then I'm going to do yoga on my day off. And they become so overwhelmed by everything that they have to do that a month in, they're like, I can't maintain this. So going from zero to 100, it's not, it's not sustainable because you are going to expect to have like these life-changing results in a month and it's not going to happen. So it starts small. We start like, can you commit to doing twice a week for 30 minutes? That's a great start. Let's commit to that. Be, and celebrate the wins as you go along because once you're going to the gym twice a week and you are like meal prepping meal prepping for me like I actually get uh, my food from a meal prep company at least for lunch because lunch was my downfall if I didn't have lunch ready I would just snack all afternoon so I knew that my bottleneck was my lunch so I just bought lunch for the whole week to keep me hold me accountable um, so you would stick to two, two times a week, eventually you're going to start seeing results. Once you start seeing results, you're going to be like, Oh, hold on a second. This is good. Then you're going to want to add another day. Nobody can force you into wanting to improve yourself, but whenever you see the improvement in yourself, you're going to want more of it. Love that. Love that. Um, so last question, and for those who, who can't hear right now, my son's yelling daddy in the background here, but um, <laughs> we, we, have the, we have the uh, one more question for Natalia. You know, I think she's dropped a lot of nuggets today. Really, you know, have appreciated her sharing her journey. And clearly fitness has been at the forefront of a lot of it. So, you know, this is called the Total Life Fitness Podcast. And we fully believe that, you know, fitness truly is, you know, more than just fitness. It, it is kind of the, the basis for every other area of your life and setting you know, kind of setting that example for other areas as well and setting that tone. But, you know, for you, like, I'll just ask you this question, Talia, like, what does fitness mean for you in your life? Uh, what has fitness done for me in my life? Yep. Oh, God. So I think that the bit, I can see my life without fitness. Let's just put it that way. And I think that fitness has always been that anchor that has reminded me of who I am. So whenever I moved, what gave me a sense of, whenever I moved from the US to, um, from Brazil to the US, what gave me a sense of self was whenever I started working out and it gave me a purpose, uh, whenever I started working out and getting ready for a competition and things like that, that got me back on track. I stopped like parting like a rock star bartending and things like that. So, and then after I had my kids, like all the moms in here and maybe the dads as well, but I'm not a dad. So I don't know how you guys feel about the whole thing, but I feel like as a mom, when you're a very independent woman and you're used to doing your own thing and you're used to being in shape and you have a child, you have a little human that's completely dependent on you and you do not have the freedom to come and go as you wish. And you're literally wiping shit for, I don't know, like months on end that you start to question, you, you start to forget who you are. You don't recognize the body that you're living in you don't recognize your routine. You do not have the ability to, you don't have that freedom anymore of just, you know what? I wanna go. And then you just go, you can do that. There is a lot more logistical arrangements that are required whenever you have a kid. And whenever I got back to the gym, I was able to remember who I am at the core. Not like, not Natalia the mom, not Natalia the businesswoman, not the, the Natalia 
anything, wife. It's just me, the raw, pure me. And, and I like for me, fitness and training, it's a lot more than the way I look. I think that the way I look is a consequence of being disciplined and to understanding that the pain in the gym is temporary. So um, I really, I really think that fitness is my core, like it's my campus. Every time that I start to feel lost, the gym has the answer. The gods of the gyms have the answer for me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Love it. So clearly it stays a part of your life, kind of centers you and and awesome. You know, really appreciate your time, Natalia. I think anyone who listened to this today, whether you're a mom, whether you're a dad, whether you don't have kids, wh whoever you are, you know, will take something away from today and, and really appreciate you sharing your journey and sharing your insight. Thank you so much for having me. And um, if any of you want to find me, I'm on, on the gram at Natalia Mello Fit. Um, it's N A T H A L. Well, hold on. N A T H A L I A, Mello, M E L O, Fit. I'm there. And probably you're going to hear a lot of the same things that I'm saying here because um, I'm very passionate about these topics, as you can probably tell. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, that, I, and I totally forgot to, forgot to ask that. I'm going to link, link everything in the show notes. So if you're watching this, we'll have everything linked in the show notes so you can go follow Natalia and, and get more of, of her passionate wisdom. All right. Thank you for having me, Luke. Absolutely.